احمده و نسلی علی رسوله الکریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته سوره بني اسرائيل this sura was revealed in makkah it has 111 verses and 12 stanza and it is the 17th by the order of arrangement the name of the sura is from the fourth verse of the sura in which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned about the bani israel but it is just as uh, it is not in a descriptive title and does not mean that bani israel is the basic theme of the sura the period of revelation as we can say that uh, from the very first verse which was revealed at the occasion of miraj it indicates which was on the 12th year of the prophethood of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so it indicates that the sura was revealed in the last stage of prophethood in makka and uh, as far as the main theme and the topics of the surahs are concerned it is a wonderful combination of warning and instructions which have been blended together in a very balanced proportion the disbelievers of makkah have been admonished to take a lesson from the miserable end of the israel and uh, other communities which uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has narrated the stories of their punishments and allah has um, uh, warned them to mend their ways within the period of respite given by allah which was about to expire and allah has instructed them therefore to accept the invitation that was being extended by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in quran otherwise uh, they will be humiliated and they will be replaced by other people similarly uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also given us the fundamental principles of morality uh, and civilization on which an islamic state and system of life is meant to be established and uh, this is a sort of an a manifesto which was intended for the islamic state of uh, medina which had been proclaimed a year before its actual establishment and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, also instructed prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to stick firmly to his stand without minding the opposition and difficulties which he was encountering and that he should never think of making a compromise with the unbelief and the muslims were also sometimes getting impatient when they met with persecution and the crooked arguments they have been instructed to face the adverse circumstances with patience and fortitude and keep full control over their feelings and passion and then salah was prescribed in order to reform and purify their souls it is just like as if it is saying that this is the thing which will produce in you those high qualities of character which are essential for everyone who intends to struggle in the righteous way so let's start the sura uh, after going through the basic theme and the basic summary of all the topics inshallah we will be covering the sura bani israel today allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained in the very first verse the journey of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying subhanallazi asra bi abdihi laylan exalted is he who took his servant by night from al masjid al haram to al masjid al aqsa whose surroundings we have blessed to show him of our signs indeed he is the hearing and the seeing now the very first verse of the sura it validates the journey of miraj or ascension which occurred in prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life on the 12th year of uh, the prophethood on 27th of rajab fragments of the whole events 
they have been narrated in authentic ahadith, which come from about like 25 companions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, when pieced together, a complete story can be narrated. There are several interpretations about the state of the journey. Some believe that this was no more than a dream or a vision. Others insist that this was just a spiritual journey. But Quran and Hadith clearly state that this was a reality and a journey taken by the body and soul. The very first word, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, subhanallah means what? Exalted is he for whom it is immensely easy to bring about this miraculous journey. And we see that it is basically the shortcomings of the humans who are confined within the limits of space and time. But for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is immensely easy for him to take his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to this miraculous journey. Just as an idea, the ride which was provided for Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was burak. Burak is from baraka, and baraka means lightning. And the, this, the ride which was provided for Prophet was what which was, it was faster than the speed of light. So it was, it's like so easy to understand and comprehend that in the world of today, if humans have built fast vehicles and even supersonic jets that cover mighty lengths and huge distances in a short time, then obviously it's not certainly difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to transport Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from masjid haram to masjid aqsa in a night journey. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Asra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa. This means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually referring to that he took Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam overnight and is clearly explaining and narrating that the night journey between the two mosques was actually taken by the body and the soul physically himself. So there's absolutely no doubt after these clear verses being revealed as a proof for the validation of the journey itself. Now, I will be briefly narrating the whole of the journey and the events and the observations which Prophet ﷺ made during this journey. The incidents, if I repeat again, was it took place in the 12th year of prophethood on the 27th Rajab. Prophet ﷺ was uh, 52 years of age. And he was staying at his cousin, Hazrat Ummihani's house. She was his paternal cousin. And there, Hazrat Jibrail, alayhi salam, he descended from the roof. And uh, Prophet sallallahu was half conscious. And Hazrat Jibrail, alayhi salam, took him to the courtyard of Kaaba. And there he cut open his chest and took out his heart and placed it in a tray. And the heart was washed thrice with the water of holy Zamzam. And then uh, Hazrat Jibrail al-Islam filled it with knowledge and patience and wisdom and faith. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was then presented with Burak. Burak was uh, white in color and it was slightly shorter than a mule and it looked like a horse. And uh, it is named Burak because of this, as I've already explained, because of its speed being as fast as lightning. And uh, we do learn from traditions that even before Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, prophets had taken journey on uh, this animal also, like Hazrat Ibrahim Alaihi Salam traveling from uh, Palestine to Mecca when he had settled Hazrat Hajra and Hazrat Ismail Alaihi Salam in Mecca before the Khana Kaaba was built. And similarly, uh, Prophet وسلم, when he came towards Burak to mount it, Burak reared and uh, has a Jibrail al-Islam pet it and uh, introduced Prophet وسلم, saying that no greater personality has mounted you till this day and will not mount you till the day of judgment. So Prophet وسلم, after mounting uh, the Burak, 
the journey started in the heavens and the first stop of the journey was in Medina where Prophet ﷺ stopped and prayed and Hazrat Jibreel ﷺ told him that by Allah's command, this would be the place where he will migrate. Then the second stopover was the Mount Sinai. And this was the place where Prophet Musa salam, had conversed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third stop was Baitul Laham. And this was the birthplace of Hazrat Isa salam, And this was the, and uh, these three were shown to Hazrat uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then uh, in these, there were other few very interesting episodes also. A voice called out to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ignored it. Hazrat Ibrahim informed that this was Judaism calling Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam towards them. Then another voice called him and he ignored it again. And Hazrat Ibrahim explained that this was Christianity and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had ignored it. So it means what? Say no to Judaism and say no to Christianity. Lakum dinukum waliyadeen. Then an incredibly attractive woman, she attempted to attract Prophet وسلم, but he paid no mind. This Jibreel said that this woman was this world and all its temptations. Then there was an old woman who emerged and uh, Prof, uh, Hazrat Jibreel said that you can estimate the age of the world by this woman. Then a man came and um, unsuccessfully attempted to gain Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's attention. Hazrat Jibreel pointed that this was shaitan who had wanted to uh, let Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam make him lose his path. A'uzu billahi min ash rajim And then uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was presented with three glasses. The first had water, the second had milk, and the third had wine. When Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose milk, Hazrat Ibrahim Alayhi Salam congratulated him on selecting the path of nature. And uh, this means say no to wine. And this also indicates indirectly in the journey of Miraj that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by his sunnah proved the, that how prohibited wine was. Finally, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived at Masjid Al-Aqsa and the Burak was tied and it was tied at the same spot where other prophets used to tie it up. And uh, then he arrived at the Hekale Suleimani and all the prophets, all the prophets who had been sent in the world by Allah, they were present, they were present, they were standing in rows and they were waiting for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to come and uh, they were ready to pray and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then led the Salah. Then after that, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, his hand was taken by Hazrat Jibreel Alayhi Wasallam and they made their way up a ladder. And from here, the part of the journey from Mecca to Masjid Al-Aqsa till here, this is the part which is known as what? As the part of Isra, the night journey. And from here till back to Masjid Al-Aqsa will be the part which is known as Mi'raj, because Ain Rajim, it means what? Something which is elevated to be high, to climb up. So this is the part which is known as Mi'raj. Now, when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went up the ladder, they reached the heavens. On reaching the first heaven, the door was closed shut and the angel serving as a guard inquired who it was. When Hazrat Ibrahim Al-Islam knocked, the angel asked who it was. Hazrat Ibrahim Al-Islam answered with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's name. And he was again asked that, had they been invited or are they permitted? That is, is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam permitted by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala shows how tight the protection and how tight the guiding of uh, all the heavens of uh, Allah is. Then, uh, Hazrat Ibrahim answered an affirmative and the door was open. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was given a gracious greeting. And then over the, all the seven heavens, he met the uh, prophets and the prominent figures. On the first heaven, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi met Hazrat Adam Alayhi 
And uh, Hazrat Adam Islam, Prophet Islam observed that uh, he would look to the people on his right and he would smile in joy. But when he would make a glance on his left, he would weep with sorrow. And when he questioned, Hazrat Jibrail told him that on the right were all the children of Hazrat Adam Islam, who were the righteous and the pious people. And he felt happy to see them. And on the left were the people all the descendants of Hazrat Adam salam, who were the bad doers or who were the evil ones. And then he would cry and he would weep and with sorrow and get upset to see all those evil doers in his descendants. So from here, he went from one heaven to the other, meeting the angels. In the second heaven, he met Hazrat Yahya salam, and Hazrat Isa salam. On the third, he met uh, Hazrat Yusuf salam, about whom he really he uh, related that his beauty was radiant and above anybody else. And then on the fourth, he met Hazrat Harun salam, and on the fifth, he met Hazrat Musa salam. And um, on the sixth, he met Harun salam. And on the seventh heaven, Prophet wasalam, saw a, a majestic, a huge palace. What was this? This was Baitul Ma'amur. This Baitul Ma'amur is a house in the seventh heaven, which is immediately above Khana Kaaba. And it is like a mirror image of Baitullah. And this is the place which is encircled by whom? By the angels. So there, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi saw hosts of angels moving to and fro. And there he saw a person, a man, who was reclining against the walls of uh, Baitul Ma'amur. And he shared his likeness with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was whom? This was Hadrat Ibrahim Alaihi Salam. And uh, to mention, on the first and on the seventh uh, heaven, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was greeted by Hazrat Adam Alaihi Salam and Hazrat Ibrahim Alaihi Salam. He was welcomed as, welcome our son. Whereas on the rest of the meetings with the rest of the prophets, they greeted Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as welcome our brother. So from here, then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was made to witness a series of events. And uh, these events that detail the punishments as well as rewards of the people who engaged in certain actions. And this is actually the essence of the journey of Miraj. We need to remember, we need to revise, and we need to adopt for the good deeds. And we need to refrain from the sins for which the punishments Prophet Wasallam was sure. Now, to start with, at a point, he saw people who were harvesting rice crops. They were harvesting ripe crops. And uh, the more they cut down, the more they would increase. And Prophet Sallallahu when asked as a Jibrail al-Islam, he told that these were the people who had struggled, that is, who had made jihad in the path of Allah. So these were whom? These were the Mujahideen being rewarded by endless reward of their jihad and the activities of jihad. At another point, there was a group of people, they were having their heads crushed under rocks. And upon inquiring, he was told that these were the people whose slumber prevented them from offering their prayers, or these were the people who had memorized the Quran and then they had forgotten it. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Then there were a group of people who wore clothes all over in patches, were grazing in the grass like animals. These were the ones who did not care to separate the obligatory zakat <coughs> their obligatory charity, that is zakat, from their wealth in life. So these were the people who did not bear zakat, their obligatory zakat. Then Prophet Sallallahu saw a man who would accumulate a pile of sticks and try to pick them up. But when the weight won't allow him to do so, he would add more sticks to the pile next time. When he asked, who this fool was, Hazrat Ibrahim salam told him that he was the person who was overburdened by his existing responsibilities of life. But instead of sorting them out, he continued to keep on adding more load to his life out of lust or out of 
foolishness. Then Prophet Sallallahu witnessed a group of people whose tongues and lips they were being cut up by scissors. It was told that these were the people who were careless with, this word, with their words and uh, they caused problems for many, many other people around them. Then he saw a small opening in a rock and a large bull coming out of it. And the bull would attempt to squeeze back in the hole, but to no avail. When asked what this meant, he was told that this was the example or the punishment of a person who carelessly blurts hurtful, problematic words. And when in the end he feels shameful, he tries to take them back, but to no avail. Then at a point he came across people who were slicing their own flesh and eating it. Astaghfirullah Rabbi. These were those who had continuously, constantly taunted others in their life. Then there was another group who had nails of red hot bronze and they were lacerating and scratching their chests and their faces. And when Prophet Sallallahu asked who they were, Jibra'il al-Islam answered that these were the people who would attack, who would attack people's respect and they would gossip and they would slander behind their backs. Then there were people who had large inflated lips similar to those of camels and they were swallowing fire. These were those who had stolen and who had devoured the wealth from the orphans. He saw people who had incredibly bloated bellies and they were filled with snakes and they were being stampeded and trampled upon by on gores, but they could not move up or budge an inch from their place. These were the people who had consumed interest and feasted on riba in their lives. Then Prophet Sallallahu went across a group of people who had clean, fresh meat laid on one side and rotten, foul-smelling meat on the other side. And they chose to eat the rotten meat over the clean meat. This group comprised of men and women who had ignored their halal and their lawful husbands and wives. And instead they had tried to satisfy themselves physically and sexually by indulging in haram relationships and adultery. And this Prophet ﷺ saw women hanging by their chests because they had given the responsibility of illegitimate heirs to their husbands by making them believe that they were their children. And then during the whole period, Prophet ﷺ saw a somber angel and he asked the Jibreel ﷺ, why? Why this angel was so serious and was so non-welcoming? Whereas all the other angels Prophet ﷺ has met, they were very warm and they were happily wel welcoming. And Hazrat Jibreel ﷺ told him that this angel was the keeper of hell fire. And uh, then Prophet Sallallahu expressed the desire to view the hell and Jibreel removed a curtain and Prophet Sallallahu he, he uh, saw the horrifying hell fire to be seen in front of his eyes. And then after that, uh, the journey progressed till Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reached Sidratul Muntaha. This was the area which marked which marked what? Which marked the ultimate position till where uh, the angels could go. And uh, beyond this, this was beyond the seventh heaven and even the angels could not pass beyond this point. And uh, it was uh, here that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made his way forward alone and Hazrat Jibreel Islam stopped at Siddhatul Muntaha. And the Prophet ﷺ made his way forward alone, and there he had the honor of conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted Prophet ﷺ with the following things. Number one, 50, 50 salahs a day were made mandatory for all the ummah of Prophet ﷺ. Then... The last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah were treated, were taught to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then uh, possible forgiveness of every sin 
except shirk of all sins which were not done consciously or which were done uh, without any awareness allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned and promised forgiveness of all those sins and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was also mentioned a reward of a minimum of 10 10 times reward for each good deed for all the individuals and followers of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then on his way back from the seventh heaven prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as he was coming down he met hazrat musa alaihi salam again and he in explained in detail the conversation with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it was there that musa alaihi salam suggested after obviously after his bitter experience with bani israil he expressed his concern and he told him that he doubted that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's ummah would not be able to perform 50 salah a day so he asked prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to turn back and to plead for reduction of salah so prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did so and allah reduced salah actually we do learn by some tradition that 10 time 10 salahs were reduced and then he returned to musa alaihi salam and he again convinced him to go back for further reduction 10 more salahs were reduced and this happened repeatedly every time until the salah were reduced to 5 and they were finally obligated and allah maintained their reward to 50 because the reward of each good deed had been promised as minimum of what as 10 times and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam returned to masjid al-aqsa where all the prophets were present yet again and then he again led the congregational prayers which most probably was the fajr prayers and then he mounted the burak and returned to makkah and when he returned to makkah he detailed the events of the miraculous night to his cousin ummihani who was the first person to meet him and he shared then after this he uh, tried to go out to share the news with the rest of people of makkah but ummihani radiyallahu ta'ala anha she held on to his shawl and uh, she begged him not to do so but prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was adamant on sharing the truth and he walked to kaaba and the first person he met there was abu jahl who was his most bitter enemy and abu jahl asked him if he had any news and yes he had news and there prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that he he told how he had visited baitul maqdis that very night and what abu jahl came up with you went and you returned from masjid al-aqsa overnight this was his question in disbelief and he he just tried to mock him and then trying to mock him even further he said that if he calls all the people of makkah then would he be willing to declare so the story in front of all, the whole of the town and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said yes he would he agreed to do so so abu jahl called out and he gathered many people around him and then he challenged muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to narrate his story and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the al sadiq al amin he detailed the entire episode but then everyone jeered at the impossibility of such an event and some of them started saying that we had a doubt about your insanity but now we don't have any doubt about it any longer and then slowly and steadily like a jungle fire the news spread all over makkah and it also got to abu bakr radiyallahu ta'ala and who his dear friend and uh, then the people who were opposing the story and the narration they asked hazrat abu bakr radiyallahu ta'ala and who did he believe and hazrat abu bakr radiyallahu ta'ala and who answered that if this is truly the narrative that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is describing then it must be true and in fact he asked prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that i've heard that people say that you're narrating this story and is it so and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that it is true i have narrated all these events and then hazrat abu bakr siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu confirmed and he said that if he is saying that this is a narration then it must be true and there is hardly anything surprising about it because i often hear that he receives messages from the heaven and i affirm that also and then hazrat abu bakr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu was very wise enough to make a question and he asked prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to describe the map of the masjid al-aqsa 
and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam obviously because he had been there he began to describe each and every aspect of the place in detail as if he was standing right in front of the mosque and abu bakr radhiyallahu ta'ala and whose smart question it proved to be a remedy which was needed to deflate the jeering crowd but and also there were people and there were merchants who had traveled to jerusalem and uh, they confirmed that masjid al aqsa looked exactly like what prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was explaining <coughs> and then moreover prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for the reconfirmation and for the proof he also told him that while he was going towards masjid al-aqsa he uh, saw the um, arab clans caravans and he uh, during his journey they were carrying this and this good and their camels how they had reared as burak had flown over them and he also told them that they had uh, uh, he had also informed the people of the caravan which valley the ca the camel had headed on to and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also explained his experience on his way back that there was another clan's caravan which was passing through a valley and the people were asleep and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam drank some water out of the vessels and he left a mark to indicate that the water had been taken and um, then he also narrated other incidents which he had observed and the people of the caravans of all those clans they returned and they reconfirmed that what prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had told them about the vessel and about the camel that was all true but still but still unfortunately those who doubted they kept on doubting and you know till now till the day of today there are people who still wonder that how could it have possibly happened but it did because allah says it did another thing which i would need to highlight is that uh, there are a lot of fabricated innovations which have been created uh, related the 27th of rajab like people offering salah and supererogatory salah and fasting and spending charity considering that it will be uh, it will be rewarded more than that on the normal days remember in the years following miraj prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself did not engage in any extra worship on the 27th of rajab neither did he encourage anyone to fast or to spend charity or he asked anybody to do anything of the sort if anyone does so he is following innovations and bidda and if the person who went on the journey himself he never marked this day as important or did anything extra then anyone else doing so is definitely surely going against sharia allahumma la tajalna minhum so in the verse 2 allah then continues with the next part of the surah and says and we gave musa alayhi salam the scripture and made it a guidance for the children of bani israel that you you not take other than me as a disposer of affairs o descendants of those we carried in the ship with noah indeed he was a grateful servant and we conveyed to the bani israel in the scripture you will surely cast corruption on the earth twice and you will surely reach a degree of great haughtiness what was this and who were the bani israel sura bani israel is basically named after this verse uh, four in which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned and talked about the behavior and the punishment of the people of bani israel people of bani israel were actually the descendants of the 12 sons of hazrat yaqub alayhi salam who was also known as israel meaning the servant of allah allah kept on sending one prophet after the another to these people to warn them about the risks of disobeying allah and the promise of the success of this world and hereafter in obeying allah the children of israel that is the bani israel they proved to be very tough and rigid and stubborn and obstinate because they did not take 
any of the messengers seriously. They mocked the prophet, they opposed their teachings, it even turned out to kill some of them. The history of the Bani Israel shows that whenever these people, they followed the teachings of the prophets, Allah would bless them. Allah would bless them with wealth and growth and development and prosperity. But whenever they, they grew arrogant and they obstinately and stubbornly, they rejected the teachings of the prophets, then they were struck by severe punishments from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. History informs us of two major events the Bani Israel were afflicted with as a result of their open transgression. And this is what is mentioned in the next two verses, in the verse number five and in the verse number seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning these two historical major events when Bani Israel were afflicted with punishment through oppressing enemies. In verse number five, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, so when the time of the promise came for the first of them, we sent against you servants of ours, those of great military might. They probed even into the homes and it was a promise fulfilled. Then we gave back to you a return victory over them and we reinforced you with wealth and sons and made you more numerous in manpower. So in verse number five, the people of Bani Israel, they were first attacked in 582 BC by the Ashuris. They were, they were the people of Ashura and uh, they were under the tyrant ruler of uh, Bukhti Nasser and the king actually besieged Jerusalem and where uh, they were, this was the place where Bani Israel lived and they burnt the pages of the Old Testament and from a population of 12 lakh people, 6 lakh were murdered and 6 lakh were turned into slaves. And one of these was the prophet Uzair himself. And when finally he got freedom, he came back to Jerusalem. And this was the incidents we've learned previously in Quran. And uh, Hazrat Uzair, uh, Hazrat Uzair he wrote the Torah with his memory. And then he rebuilt the Baitul Maqdas as the second tem temple, which is also known as Baitul Sani. Verse number seven, and if you do good, you do good for yourselves. If you do good, you do good for yourselves. And if you do evil, you do it to yourselves. Then when the final, that is the second promise came, we sent your enemies to sadden your faces and to enter the temple in Jerusalem as they entered it the first time and to destroy what they had taken over with total destruction. So the second attack on the Bani Israel, it came after the time of Hazrat Isa as a result of Bani Israel rejecting the Allah's commandments once again. In 70 AD, the Romans attacked them under the command of Titus, and they broke down Hazrat Suleiman Salam's temple, the second temple that had been built by Hazrat Uzair Salam, and they burnt down the Masjid the Aqsa all again. Then Allah said, it is expected that if you repent, that your Lord will have mercy upon you. But if you return to sin, we will return to punishment. And we have made hell for the disbelievers a prison bed. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Indeed, this Quran guides you to which is most suitable and gives good tidings to the believers who do righteous deeds that they will have a great reward and that those who do not believe in hereafter, we have prepared for them a painful punishment. And man supplicates for evil as he supplicates for good. And man is ever hasty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also ordered us and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has informed all of us that all indecent hastes are from shaitan. And we have made the night and the day two signs and we erased the sign of the night and made the sign of the day visible that you may seek 
bounty from your Lord and may know the number of years and the account of time and everything we set out in detail. And for every person we have imposed his fate upon his neck and we will produce for him on the day of resurrection a record which he will encounter spread open. Allahumma hasibna hisab bin yasira. And it will be said, read your record. Sufficient is yourself against you this day as an accountant. Verse number 15, whoever is guided is only guided for the benefit of his soul and whoever errs only errs against it and no bearer of burdens will bear the burden of another and never would we punish until we sent a messenger. So the last part of the verse means what? It answers the question to a uh, a problematic question which arises in many minds. There are many people who keep on questioning that all those people to whom the teaching and the messages and the commandments of Quran and Hadith have not reached and they tend to err and they disobey or they did transgress, then would it be fair? Would it be fair to punish them by hellfire? And wouldn't it be unfair to throw them in the hell pit? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all just. And Allah is all al-adil. So how would all this be settled? Many people wonder about the areas which are the isolated areas of the earth. You know, there are areas like the Amazonian jungles, the icy edges of Antarctica, where the message of Islam, even under the modern methods of communication, has not yet reached. Remember, Allah is just. In that, he will always present people with the opportunity to differentiate between good and evil before he decides to send them to heaven and hell. Allah would never forcibly send someone to hell if they were never presented with the choice between good and evil. And Allah is not unfair as to dump unaware people into hell. And I will be narrating the message of the words from a tradition in Musnad Ahmad, where we know that Prophet explained that all those people who were unaware of Islam would be presented with truth and untruth on the day of judgment by an angel on the command or order of Allah. And this angel would do what? He would teach them about faith, about belief, laws of Allah, introduce them to Allah, his attributes, the Jannah and the hellfire. And after explaining, the angel will show them the hell. And then the angel will tell them that Allah, to which they were already introduced, well, the angel will tell them, Allah commands you to jump into this fire. Now, the ones who would obey Allah's commandment, they will jump in the fire. And the fire, with the mercy of Allah, would transform into the gardens of Jannah. While those who would refuse obstinately and stubbornly still refuse, despite knowing, understanding, the attributes of Allah and the orders of Allah and the concept of reward of Jannah and the punishment of hellfire, despite knowing everything, those who will refuse will then be thrown fairly into the hellfire. Rabbibni li'aindaka baitan fil jannah, Allahumma ajirna minan nar. And when we intend to destroy a city, we command its effluent, but they faintly disobey therein. So the word comes into effect upon it and we destroy it with complete destruction. And how many have we destroyed for generations after Nu salam? And sufficient is your Lord concerning the sins of his servants as acquainted and seen. Verse number 18. Whoever should desire the immediate, immediate means what? This worldly life. We hasten from him. We hasten for him from it. What we will to whom we intend, then we have made for him hell, which he will enter to burn, censored and banished. This verse highlights a very 
important concept of Quran. And similarly, in the verse 19 also, Allah further explains, but whoever desires the hereafter and exerts efforts due to it while he is a believer, it is those whose effort is ever appreciated by Allah. So in this verse 18 and 19, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually explaining what? That all the believers need to do their deeds and actions with the desire and intention of hereafter. Prophet sallallahu said, whoever is focused only on this world, Allah will confound his affairs and make him fear poverty constantly. And he will not get anything of this world except that which had been decreed for him. And whoever is focused on hereafter, Allah will settle his affairs for him and make him feel content with his last and his provisions and worldly gains will undoubtedly, they will come to him. So Allah wants what? And Allah looks for what? for sincerity of intentions. As has been reported by Hazrat Umar bin Khattab ta'ala and who in Muslim and Bukhari, that Prophet sallallahu said, innamal a'malu bin niyat, the reward and the dependence of reward of deeds, it depends upon the intentions. Everyone will get the reward according to what he has intended. So whoever immigrated the worldly benefits or for a woman to marry, his immigration was for what he immigrated for. So Allah wants his servants to carry out the good deeds, not for the sake of this world, but for the sake of the lasting, for the sake of the eternal hereafter. Remember, all our deeds... All our deeds have to be not to please, not to impress all those around us, but to please Allah. Not for gaining worldly gains or benefits, but to gain the success of hereafter. Not to save ourselves from the worldly losses or failures, but to save us from what? The greatest loss of the day of judgment. All our deeds should not be to prevent the displeasure of our loved ones, but to avoid the displeasure of our beloved Lord, our sustainer, our creator. Remember, all the deeds need to be the best deeds are those which are targeted with the intentions of what? Number one, to gain the pleasure of Allah. Number two, to avoid displeasing Allah. Number three, to save ourselves from hellfire. Number four, to secure our admissions in Jannah. Remember, when the actions stem from these four intentions, the result will then be a deed, will then be amale swaliha, which will be accounted for in the form of good deeds in the scales of the day of resurrection. Now the question arises, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place such an importance on correcting person's intention? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't gain anything out of it. And why should Allah be bothered that when we do something, we need to do with, with the intention to please him or not to displease him or to get his jannah or to save ourselves from his hellfire? Why should Allah be bothered about it? But remember, he does it out of love for his bondsmen because he knows that any act he knows, he who is all-knowing, he knows that any act or deed which is done solely with intention of this world is not enough to provide the person with steadfastness he requires and is capable of also. Because, you know, you know, when his actions 
when we we all strive, we all work, we all strive, we all struggle and we do effort, we are never sure that we may achieve and there may be failure also. But when in this worldly, in this worldly life, when we desiring a worldly achievement with a worldly target or goal, we fail. We fail despite struggling and striving and making efforts. We fail to achieve what we wanted to. This leads to depression, anxiety. And it leads to what? It leads to frustration and the person giving up all the effort. And then giving up all the effort, we need to further failure and chances of never succeeding at all. But intentions and actions for the sake of hereafter, they will be devoid of both these failures and frustrations and anxieties, and there will be a continuous effort. And we know that the slow and steady finally wins, wins the race. I will make you understand this with an example of our day-to-day -day life. Just imagine there is a lady who just works and who just tries to struggle and make effort to please her husband and her in-laws so that they may acknowledge her, they may give her respect, and she develops a status and a position in her family. But you know she can only strive to please them for a short while because if her husband, he does not respond and he does not in return does not provide her with the love, with the respect, with the attention she was working for and she was craving for, then she will not be able to continue all doing all this for long. She'll become depressed. She will be disappointed. She will be frustrated and she will give it up all. She'll say to hell with them. I can't please them. He is so stubborn. He is so obstinate. They're all so hard hearted and she'll give up all the efforts. But on the other hand, if she fulfills the same lady. If she is fulfilling her duties towards her husband, her in-laws, her father-in-law, her mother-in-law, with the knowledge that Allah, Allah has ordered her to do all this and Allah is watching her and will reward her with the palaces of Jannah, her husband or her family's acknowledgements would hardly matter to her as long as she knows that he, for whom she is doing all this, he is al-Basir, al-Sami, al-Khabir, al-Shakiran alima. He is watching, he is listening, and he will value her efforts. This knowledge will be enough for her to keep on going. This will be enough to keep her firmly planted on the right track, and this will save her from hopelessness, from depression, from frustration and giving up. And in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward her, will help her, will guide her, will aid her to the best way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards his devoted people with success in matters of this world as well. And so this woman will be guided, will be aided, will be supported as well as be rewarded in the world hereafter. This is exactly why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages all the bondsmen to work for Allah's player so that he may help fix up their problems of this world and reward them with heaven, with the Jannah in hereafter. To each category, we extend to these and to those from the gifts of your Lord, and never has the gift of your Lord been restricted. Look how we have favored in provision, some of them over the others, but the hereafter is greater in degree of difference and greater in distinction. Do not make us equals with Allah and other deity, and thereby become censored and forsaken. Verse number 23. Now, from here onwards, in the third and the fourth stanza are very important commandments of Allah. And these commandments are like very similar, which were given to Hazrat Musa when he was invited for a 40-day 
ex excursion on the Mount of Tur, because the teachings to all the prophets were essentially the similar because Allah is one. The person, the deity who's going to command is one. And the commandments were, and your Lord has decreed to you not to worship except him. So the first order, the first right on all the bondsmen is the right of Allah. And in the rights of Allah, the first right is belief and faith in the oneness of Allah. To obey, to believe, to worship, to have faith and to surrender to one and the only one Allah. And then to parents. Immediately after, immediately after the rights of Allah, not only once, in multiple verses and in multiple surahs of Quran, Surah Baqarah, Surah Nisa, Surah Bani Israel, Surah Luqman, Surah Al-An'am, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala order the bondsmen after the right of Allah comes the right of the parents. And here in this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the conduct and the mannerism of the children with their parents. The right of the parents is the right in Islam, a mother whose right is threefold more than that of the father. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained how a companion he carried his mother on his back and performed all the duties of his hajj, could not fulfill the right of the mother. In Islam, the father is the children's door to heaven. Refusing to serve the parents, disobeying them, displaying contempt towards them leads to what? Allah refuses to answer their prayers, even on the day, on the night of Laylatul Qadr, misbehaving towards them misbehaving towards the parents, any one of them or both of them would annul every good deed. In this ayah, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs all the children on their conduct towards the patient. They deserve utmost respect, kindness, not even a single ur, uh, not even a single uff to be uttered to them. So this is what Allah is explaining whether one or both of them reach old age. While with you, say not to them so much as of, and do not repel them, but speak to them a noble word, and lower to them the wings of humility out of mercy, and say, this is the supplication which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught all of us to make for our parents. Rabbi rahamhuma kama rabbayani sahira. My Lord, have mercy upon them as they brought me up when I was small. Verse number 25, your Lord is most knowing of what is within yourself. If you should be righteous in intentions, then indeed he is ever to the often returning to him forgiving. 